Good afternoon, everyone. How awesome and magical is it to be at the 2022 AUSA Annual Meeting? Woohoo! And we're in person and online. So thank you so much for coming um, to the Senior Leaders Town Hall. We're so appreciative that you're here. I want to also say a special thank you to the Washington Tattoo, if you were able to hear them as you were coming in, and to our mascots who are out at the door. What top class they add to our family forum. At this time, we would like to recognize our Family Forum 3 title sponsor, the Wounded Warrior Project. The continuous support the Wounded Warrior Project provides to our wounded, ill, injured service members, veterans, and their families is truly, truly appreciated. Representing the Wounded Warrior Project today is Lieutenant General Retired Mike Lennington, CEO. Sir? <laughs> Jose Ramos, Vice President, Government and Community Re Relations. John Eaton, Vice President, Complex Care. Bria Kratzer, Vice President, Resource Development and Business Development. And Zachariah Pearson, Corporate Partnerships Specialist. Thank you, thank you so much to our title sponsor, the Wounded Warrior Project. Thank you. Now we would like to recognize the AUSA Volunteer Family of the Year. The AUSA Volunteer Family of the Year Award recognizes an exceptional Army family whose dedicated volunteer service promotes the well-being of soldiers and families and improves their local community. To be considered for the award, though, the family can only be nominated through one of our wonderful all-volunteer-run AUSA 120 chapters. We would like to bring, now the family doesn't know this, this is a surprise. We would like to bring up on stage this, the, um, the family of the year to join me. Um, I apologize, uh, the sponsor for the family of the year award was not able to make it, but they do have a surprise for you later tonight and I'll share that with you. But if you would like to join me up here on stage, I would appreciate it. The Tomasuro family embod embodies the phrase, staying ready together. Thank you. Oh. They share their time and talents as a family, right, with their soldier and family readiness groups. Woohoo, thank you. <laughs> Habitat for Humanity, the American Red Cross, spearheading the 161st Vietnam Veterans Reunion, and hosting the Gold Star Teen Adventure to name a few of all the things they do together as a family. AUSA's Fort Jackson Palmetto State Chapter nominated the Thomas Soro family when they were stationed at Fort Jackson. But like all military families, they have PCS and they are now at Joint Base, Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington. The Thomas Soro family includes Sergeant First Class Timothy Thomas Soro, his wife Amanda, and their three adorable children, Timothy Jr., who is 15, Zoe, who's 13, and 11-year-old Mackenzie. They are also the 2021 Fort Jackson Family of the Year. It is with heartfelt gratitude that the AUSA Family Readiness Directorate and the Volunteer Family of the Year program sponsor, Veterans United Home Loans, presents you with a token of appreciation to include this wonderful gift up here, a monetary gift, and for the first time in support of our military spouse employment and internship, an internship offer to Mrs. Thomasura. Oh, wow. So, wow. this is. Thank you. So, we will talk again. Sure, of course. Good TJ says off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So
So thank you to the Tamasur family for your outstanding leadership, your generosity, and commitment to the military community. We'll be able to make sure we ship that to you. I don't think it'll go home on the plane. <laughs> thank you. Next, I would like to introduce our moderator, Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen. He is the new Deputy Chief of Staff for Installations G9. Lieutenant General Vereen is the principal advisor to Army senior leaders on installation policy, plans and resources, which include housing, childcare, and other quality of life programs for all components. Installation armories and reserve centers serve as the Army's foundation and support for the readiness and well being of soldiers, civilians, families, and soldier for life. Sir, Thank you so much for agreeing to being the moderator today for the town hall and welcome Lieutenant General Vereen. Okay. All right. So good afternoon. Uh, before we begin, I want to uh, take the opportunity to thank AUSA and recognize Holly for all the work she's done on these family forums. Uh, they provide a great opportunity for uh, those problems that are facing our people. So I want to thank you for being a great partner and advocate for our soldiers and families. It is definitely my honor to moderate this year's AUSA Army Senior Leader Town Hall. Army families make selfless contributions to strengthening our brave warriors and nation's defense. They play an important part in mission readiness. The Army is committed to providing care, support, and services necessary to ensure a ready Army. So at this time, please give a warm Army welcome to our Army senior leaders. First, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Christine E. Warmoth, the 25th Secretary of the Army. Honorable Warmoth is the senior official within the Department of Defense on all matters relating to the U.S. Army and has over 20 years of experience working in the field of national security and defense. Secretary Warmoth is here to provide an update on all the hard work the Army is doing in support of our families and their quality of life. She is married to a retired Navy officer and has two daughters. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> I emphasize that, Madam Secretary. <laughs> the 40th Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville, is also here to share his insights on his efforts to improve readiness and quality of life programs for our soldiers, families, Army civilians, and soldiers for life. I also want to recognize his wife of 35 years, Maria, Conville, who, who, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, who the chief also credits as being the foundation and strength of the family. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that they have three children who are serving in the Army and a son-in-law who also serves. Let's give a round of applause for that. Finally, the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, better known as Alexandra's husband <laughs> and father of two amazing women. Sergeant so Major of the Army, Michael Grinston, brings his perspective on soldier and family support and its direct influence upon Army readiness. The SMA is currently championing initiatives focusing on the exceptional, exceptional family member program, improving access to meaningful spouse employment, child care and housing, and expanding support for soldiers who are single parents. SMA Grinston, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause 
to our panelists. So Honorable Warmoth will provide opening remarks, followed by General McConville, and then the Sergeant Major of the Army, our Sergeant Major Grinston. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will keep these opening remarks brief because, you know, frankly, we really want to hear from you all, uh, and we don't want to take up t your time, uh, you know, giving you a bunch of talking points. Uh, I am very, very pleased to be here. Um, I want to thank all of you, all of our great families, for uh, making it possible for our soldiers and NCOs and officers to do everything they do. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity in the last year and a half to talk with a lot of families and to better appreciate the tremendous support system that they are and all the sacrifices that uh, our Army families do to be able to serve in the Army. I want to recognize the Tomasura family, our family of the year, uh, who we were able to give the award to yesterday. That was fantastic. Thank you, uh, all of you, for everything you do. I talked uh, quite a bit yesterday morning in the speech uh, for the opening ceremonies about the Army of 2030, and a lot of that was talking about uh, what the Army of 2030 has to be able to do in order to fight and win the nation's wars. So a lot of it was about war fighting and our modernization program, but I also spent a lot of time talking about the Army of 2030 and what that means in terms of its people. Because frankly, if we don't have um, the best people and if we don't take care of our people, it won't really matter even if we develop the most amazing you know, new weapon systems and technologies. People really are the backbone of this army and we have to take care of our folks. Um, Secretary Austin, I hope all of you have had the opportunity to see his taking care of people memo that came out in the last couple of weeks. He is very, very committed, you know, as a former Army uh, general, he is, I think, very in tune to our service members' um, needs and the things that are on their minds. And so that um, set of initiatives is an effort to try to make sure that we are taking care of our folks. And I would say that is a down payment. You know, we certainly, General McConville and I, the SMA, want to continue uh, to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to give you all the resources and support that you need. I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of folks at posts around the country. I've heard quite a bit about, um, about inflation, about the rising costs of housing, about barracks conditions, about uh, access to childcare, access to health care uh, and mental health resources. And we are really working to try to make sure that we make that available to you. Um, and part of the reason we have this great forum is to be able to hear from you and solve problems. I would ask all of you that as we uh, work to try to solve some of these problems, that we keep the channels of communication open. Uh, we're better positioned to be able to help you if we know what help is needed. So please make sure that you're reaching out and letting us know what your concerns are. Um, you know, I, I, again, I won't sort of go over all the stuff that I talked about yesterday morning. Recognizing that there is absolutely always more work that needs to be done, we are investing in better housing. We are working um, day in, day out with the CEOs of our privatized housing companies to make sure that they are supporting you all. We are building new child development centers. We are paying our CDC staff more. Uh, we are trying a variety of sort of recruiting and retention incentives to try and hire more staff into our CDCs. Um, we have rolled out, you know, the new enhanced EMFP portal to try to streamline enrollment uh, and make that process less burdensome. So there's a lot, I think, that we're doing to try to support all of you and our families, but uh, my main message is, you know, we're going to keep working on it. Over to you, Chief. And, and thanks, Sarah. Just, just real quick, because as Secretary, we want to get to your questions, but, you know, in the Army, we say people first. We don't say soldiers first. And the reason we say that is we talk about our people, we're talking about our soldiers, our families, our civilians, and our soldiers for life. And we recruit soldiers, but we retain families. And, and that is really important. And that what really, when you look at the leaders, 89% of our sergeants above have families. So if we want to retain the talent that we need to do what we need to do, that's why this is extremely important. And we, we are far from uh, perfect when it comes to uh, taking care of our, our families. But this forum, at least for me, has been very, very helpful 
uh, getting the feedback we get from you. Some, some of the problems we'll be able to solve right away, some are long-term problems, but we are definitely interested in getting your feedback, uh, understanding that, and making sure we, we maintain the world's greatest army. So, Sergeant Major. Secretary Chief, uh, thanks for having me. And um, I thoroughly enjoy these family forums. I've had them mostly uh, almost around the globe. So I'll open up with what I normally open up with and the Secretary of the Chief normally may not like that. I want to hear your hard problems and your challenging topics. And normally I challenge everybody for that and they, they do normally not disappoint. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it's like, uh, sometimes they do not hold any punches, um, but it's for all the right things because I want to be able to, to bring those issues, um, whether that's uh, those issues out at Fort Irwin and I see General Taylor. We had a couple of turns at uh, families. Uh, they took a couple of body shots at me uh, out there all the way to Fort Stewart when I talked to those uh, the families um, when we just did a no-notice deployment for the 1st Brigade of the 3rd ID, when well, the first time since I've been in the Army did a no-notice deployment of an Army Brigade combat team. So we have to hear those. We have to hear those challenging topics where we're not going to get the policy and the money in the right spot. Uh, and that's always why I lead that um, if you hold back, um, then I'm sure the Secretary of the Army would be very sad if you held back on your questions. Um, <laughs> uh, with that said, uh, but we do like to action it, and there's some things that we've looked into that I think has just come from uh, things that I've been traveling around, and, and we all have, and one of those is a parenthood policy. It's, that's how we changed the policy, and it goes, it went from a small family forum where somebody said, Sergeant Major, you know, here's some of the things we're dealing with with the family, and then, then they sent me a really nice letter, an email, uh, and then we worked on this, and then out pops a parenthood policy. Same thing with Enterprise Exceptionally Family Member Program. It really stemmed from PCC, and the chief and I were sitting there, and somebody said, how do we do assignments if we have an EFMP program, and how do we modernize that? How do, when the marketplace, I can't see that I can go to that place because I don't know if my family can be supported in that area. So those are the things we're championing, but it all comes from your feedback. So I look forward to your feedback. And then more importantly, I look forward to handing all those off to the director of the Army staff to help us with those. <laughs> uh, other than that, Madam Secretary Chief, uh, I look forward, and for everyone, I look forward to your questions. All right, that was a great segue into questions. So uh, we're gonna get ready for them. Uh, if you have a question, there's some rules uh, for one of our senior leaders. I would ask that you use the question cards that were provided for you, or you can raise your hand and one of our staff will bring a microphone to you. I also ask that you be concise with your questions so uh, we can address as many questions as possible. We also have people in the back of the room monitoring and streaming webcasts for questions, so we'll take some of those from our viewers as well. Um, and I will be reading some of the questions to you from the podium as well. So let's get started. All right, uh, the first question. All right, so as we continue to reduce the stigma of help seeking behavior around mental illness, do you believe we are getting closer to treating mental illness like any other disease? I'll take that for starters, I guess. Uh, you know, one of the things I say to soldiers and families when this topic comes up is, I myself have seen a counselor. Um, I, I've gotten divorced and remarried. I had teenagers. I'm guessing some of you have teenagers. You know, all good reasons sometimes to go and see a counselor uh, and get help. Um, and so, you know, I, I really try to encourage and get the message out that uh, taking advantage of behavioral health resources is, is actually a sign of strength, not a vulnerability. It's helping yourself solve a problem, and there's nothing to be ashamed about when it comes to doing that. Uh, you know, we are, I think, doing a better job of um, making behavioral health resources available. You know, certainly when we saw some um, serious signs of strain in Alaska, uh, working with the chaplain, with our MFLIX and others, we surged resources there. Uh, General Eifler started the Mission 100 where everyone uh, in the 11th Airborne Division does a mental health wellness check on an annual basis. And I think we see that helping and we're doing that in some other places. 
One of the biggest challenges we have, though, is, you know, um, nationwide, we have a shortage of behavioral health resources. And so, you know, the pandemic's been hard on everyone. And I think um, one of the biggest things we've got to keep working on is trying to increase the capacity of the behavioral health resources that are available for our folks, particularly in more remote locations where it can be har harder to hire civilians, um, you know, places like Fort Irwin, for example. Yeah, I just think we need to, in some ways, and I've talked to, you know, parents who have lost their sons and daughters, and one of the best insights I got was from a Gold Star mother who said, you know, along the lines of, you know, people don't commit heart disease, they die of heart disease. Think about that. People don't commit suicide, they die of suicide. So if someone has a problem with heart disease, they don't hesitate to go see a doctor. And I think there's some people that are higher risk for heart disease because of maybe, you know, genes and those type things, but there's also people that are higher risk for heart disease because of maybe some of their, you know, that what they eat or they smoke or they don't exercise, all those type things. And I think it's the same thing, you know, we start thinking about mental health is, you know, we need to have resources available. And just like heart disease, if you go, if you treat it early on, when things are just starting to develop, I think we can save a lot more lives. And so we are committed to making sure that healthcare is available. Some of the, some of the leaders are going out there and, and trying to break down the stigma by everyone's, you know, get, getting a checkup and, you know, checking your cholesterol, just like you check your mental health. And I think we need to continue to do that. Sir, uh, I'll try to keep my remarks short. Uh, here's why. This is a really difficult topic that we've uh, really been studying uh, for a little while. And I will frame it is that uh, number one, it's okay to seek mental health. I did it, I announced it a couple of times in November, and um, recently I asked to go back. Um, it was a tough summer in the Grinston family. Um, and I said, um, well, maybe it's time for me to go get another checkup. Um, and I did ask um, to put me back on the docket. Um, so everybody, uh, it's okay to seek help if you need help but i do want to caution you is that that is not the panacea for all your problems and i say that because we are human beings and this is just what i believe the connections matter um, you can't just have one if you only have one and it's only that connection to behavioral health i think we're all at risk to something uh, and the more connections you have the better um, so we can't just say, oh, just go to behavioral health. Well, um, but if you have no friends, you have no family, going to behavioral health, you know, I think you're still at a risk for a lot of things. Um, and I, I think what I find is leaders sometimes go, well, you went to behavioral health, good to go. And if you haven't read a book by Dr. Greg Bryan, um, Rethinking Suicide, I encourage you all to do that. Um, and what he says is that we're all at risk. You, sp you, you have some bad things in your life. Um, maybe you seek behavioral health. Maybe you can talk to a chaplain. Maybe you go to the NFLEC. Um, I think that's when we use all the resources that we have, uh, I think we're all going to be in a better mental state. But we can't just use only one resource. And that only one resource gets me to behavioral health but there's a whole ton of other resources. And some of those resources are your family, your friends, your golf buddies, your running partners, your chief of staff of the army, <laughs> right? That's your squad. Um, and I really caution us all is that sometimes it's like, go seek behavioral health. We're good, you went to behavioral health and we can't figure out why you're still having a lot of issues because we are not connecting all the dots. Again, it's 100% okay to seek behavioral health. I still have my TS clearance. I still get to go to all the meetings. I still get to be the Sergeant Major of the Army. <laughs> oh, and maybe, no, never mind. Let me know once. Good. Okay, next question. How does EFMP work with Command Management Division when generating the command select list? That is a more detailed question than I am able to answer on my own. So I would look out and it's a little bit hard to see. I don't know whether uh, General Vereen, you want to take that or if we have someone from our G9. Um, G, 
HRC. HRC. Um, you want. I, Madam Secretary. Oh, go I'll, for it. Uh, SMA. I'll start because um, there's an enlisted part of this too. Yeah. So Great. Um, for the command select list uh, for the CSMs, so please 100% update your uh, EFMP in the system. There's a lot of SAR majors uh, as master sergeant when you go to the CSL for battalion and brigade. If you don't have that updated, it's hard for us to go, oop. Let's go for this assignment. So what, what the goal is to look at the assignments and then for the CSMs, I'm just talking about the CSM program. And uh, if HRC or G1 can correct me if I say anything messed up, but we look at that and try to say, okay, this is where you can go. But if your EFMP is not updated, it makes it a lot harder. And yes, we have some of those. Um, but we look at where you're going, what are the resources, but then there is a choice. And, and we, Chief, you and I remember, we've heard this at PCC. We've had this debate, like, Sergeant Major, we'll just take all those assignments if I can't go there with my family off. And some people say, wait a minute. I always wanted to be this, whatever this is. And if that can't support where you go, um, do you want us to make that choice or do you want to have that choice? So we could say you don't get to go to be the 4th Brigade and 101st because that doesn't support your family and they can't, they don't have the capacity. So we, for on the list side, we're very cautious of that when we look at the, at the CSMs, uh, but the biggest thing is please update your EFMP in the system so then when we're doing, here's a battalion available or brigade that uh, it will support your family. Yeah, cause it, is it G1 here? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna turn over to you for the final on, on the slating thing. I, you know, we wanna get people you know, an opportunity to serve wherever we can support them serving. And some people say, well, why don't you just know, you know, that, you know, Fort Carson is this. And it really, you know, the challenge becomes, and this is where as we do a better job of, you know, getting a 21st century talent management system, we will know because assignments will get updated very, very quickly. But if you think about it right now, people go, well, how come you can't tell me whether I can go here or not? Depending on you know, your dependent situation, it may be because it's depending on a specialist. So that specialist that happened to work at Fort Carson that does absolutely all the things that you need for your child's care may move. And then all of a sudden we don't have that specialist there. But what we want to do and where we're trying to go is get to that level of uh, fidelity where we know exactly where everything is. And as you go into the marketplace, wherever you're going, you know exactly what that is. And, and we can work our way through it. So, Roy, you want to add anything to that? Yes, I will. So, sir, the Sergeant Major hit it right on the head. We're taking in information now. We have a new system, EEFMP, out there that makes it a lot easier to, bring, to put it in there. But all of those things come into play as we're looking at the assignments. There's, there are care providers out there that we may know about now, but say for mental health, they've got too many patients. So we have to bring all of those things in, into play. But the very first step is us knowing what exactly that, that the individual and the family needs. Okay. All right, this question is probably um, OTSG um, to follow up if there's some uh, responses from the panel. So how will care and access to resources change with the medical treatment facility, medical billet cuts. Yeah, I think that's definitely one for the <laughs> wonderful General Scotty Dingle. Hey, sir, you want my mic? <laughs> Twenty minutes. Yeah. The, the one thing that I, that I will say is that when when the, the secretary and the chiefs say that that people you know are, are first. Uh, they mean that. And so for, for many of you all have seen in the press that initially the number was uh, 6,900 plus military billets cut from the MedCom. It, it was the chief and the secretary who said, you know, uh, General Dingle, no, uh, I'm not going to do that because I'm impacting the readiness of our soldiers and our family members. And then so, you know, we redid the assessment. Uh, the number was brought down to, you know, 2,900, you know, or plus. Those 2,900 that have been identified are from uh, my MedCom uh, billets, and those were, are low risk that do not impact any of the services that are being provided at any of our medical treatment facilities. 
With that said, of course, uh, in the NDAA, there were stipulations that we cannot make any cuts until approved by the Hill, and we've laid it out. Uh, we've run the numbers. There is no impact to the cuts that we uh, have identified. We also are working with the Defense Health Agency uh, to, to increase, I know the big one's behavioral health, uh, not cutting any military behavioral health. Where there are challenges of behavioral health uh, in our remote areas, that's where uh, myself as the Surgeon General leverage our uniform personnel to fill some of those civilian hard to hire billets. Overseas, likewise, the guidance from the Secretary and the Chief to me is to move my military personnel to provide more uh, capacity and capability, uh, in this case, Behavior Health, Alaska, uh, and other remote areas. So there are no cuts as of yet, but when the cuts do come, if they come, uh, there will be no impact to the services that will be provided on medical treatment facilities. Yeah, here's some, at least from the, the Chief Staff of the Army. We, we, we want to make sure that our soldiers, our families, and soldiers for life are getting the health care they deserve. And, you know, we are in a transitions, and transitions are always dangerous times, and, you know, people moving various, um, you know, plans and beneficiary plans and who's getting what, where, and, and what we need is your feedback. So if you're in an area where you've been, you know, put out, uh, you know, in the civilian community and, and we're not getting you the health care that you need, we need to know that. And, you know, as, as Scotty said, as we, we will, we'll move people to make sure we have the appropriate uh, medical capability. So, some of you may be better served by, you know, the, the type of medical care you're getting, but we need to know that. And if you don't come back to us and let us know, we won't know. We will uh, move our medical personnel to provide that type of care. And we are, you know, and, and the other thing is bringing back up, hey, TRICARE doesn't provide for this, or, you know, the, the medical plan we have you know, yeah, we have we have medical insurance, but it doesn't work. No one will take it. And we, you know, to, to me, you know, we have a sacred obligation to provide medical care to our soldiers, our families, and our, our soldiers for life, and we are committed to doing that. Okay. All right, I guess what goes around comes around, because this one's a G9, probably. <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. All right, so, uh, so we heard about community connections this morning, and, and ACS is the most effective organization to connect families to resources. ACS has been cut a lot in the last several years. Is the Army going to evaluate if, if the ACS cuts were too much? You know, let me start with that, um, Kevin, and then mm -hmm. turn it over to you as you like. You know, as the Chief said, Similar to healthcare, we want to make sure that our folks have what they need and have the support uh, services that they need. So every time we build the POM, we try to dig into you know the issues enough to be able to understand and make um, informed choices about where there are trade-offs. And I think you know that's that is something we we have a um, processes underway where we can actually sort of go in and do deep dives into issue areas and i think you know that's something we can look at the connections program um, whether we've got the level of resources there right uh, because i i heard it was you know it's a great program i heard there was a terrific session this morning um, and so we want to make sure that we're not cutting uh, into bone certainly yeah one of the things that you know i've learned at a bunch of di different um post is is really the services that ACS are providing one size doesn't fit all and you know I, I remember being a uh, you know a post senior commander at a post and we had like 513 programs and you know you're trying to go okay which ones we can't afford them all we want to afford the ones that really make a difference and you know and, and what we want to do and we're trying to do is is have again get feedback uh, to se se senior commanders you know, which programs are working, which ones, you know, did we cut? We've had some of those type things where we cut some, some key people and organizations, and we just need to make sure we know what they are, and, and we can, you know, and there are always opportunities to bring them back if we missed it. Uh, but we, you know, we, we, we are taking a look at those type things. So I made an answer. Um, I'll highlight uh, two areas that you could help us out, and I would actually ask for help. You know, ACS is a fairly broad topic, you know. Um, I would ask for more specificity, like what function did we cut? 
Um, not for now. You can send that to me. My team will love that. Uh, please, uh, like seriously, um, that's number one is uh, please let us know as as we travel around in those family forums and you're meeting with the Sergeant Major Jeremy said, hey, you cut this. You know, why did you do that? And let's have a discussion um, and not, you know, generalize just ACS. It actually helps us what inform us on what specifically in your area that you cut that maybe we need to, to bring back. Um, that's number one. And then number two, we, we still have the Army Family Action uh, Program. The vice uh, chairs that, and I know the DAS has shared it a couple of times with me, and those from your installation, these things come up and said, hey, we cut this, and then we need to look at it from the Department of the Army all the way through Senior Mission uh, Command Authority. So there's two ways to get uh, these issues bubbled up if we're cutting something. Um, just let us know. But I, you know, I would just ask to say, hey, it was this in the ACS, not all ACS. And it may be specific, like the chief said, for your location. Okay. All right. Uh, I think this is um, a, a great topic to take back. Uh, and we'll, we'll take this one on in the task force. Uh, we've got uh, over 80 folks on our task force for quality of life. And uh, this is one we'll, we'll definitely uh, dig into and uh, make sure that um, we're advised the right way. Uh, but it's all about feedback. And so we appreciate um, any feedback you can provide to us. Uh, and then we'll take that with us as well. So thank you. Okay, we got a question in the room. Yes, um, thank you so much, first of all, for all the esteemed panelists. Uh, I have been a longstanding uh, volunteer with the Association of the U.S. Army out of Kuwait uh, since 2007. And as a result, I have been in exposure with many soldiers, uh, things related to the mental health and physical health. And uh, coincidentally, I'm also a volunteer in uh, cancer patient support and prevention since 2012. So I needed to make a comment that there is a gray area between the physical health and mental health. And that goes into stress management and connecting to people and caring about people and seeing what the, um, uh, the army here is doing and the budget that has been allocated for physical and, and wellness in general, both mental and physical, is impressive. So I just needed to uh, commend you on that and to draw to the attention of prevention. Just something simple as awareness about stress management, recognizing it and connecting to, the, to people can be a defining line between um, uh, anything that can be preventable in, in both uh, physical and mental health. And they, they really interact with each other. What we eat can impact our mood and how we think can, can go the other way around. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's great to hear. I and mean, we have invested in the, the risk and resilience councils, the health and holistic fitness. Uh, I think there's a lot more um, understanding, just as you said, as the connection between sort of uh, mental health and physical health and all of that. Um, and it really can make a difference. So it's good to, good to hear that you think um, you're seeing some results out there. And Madam Secretary, I'll put a shameless plug for the Army Wellness Centers. Uh, if you haven't visited those Army Wellness Centers, they have stress management. They do classes. It's one of my favorite places to go. They give you some meditation. They got this really great, you know, chair, you know, that sits in there for, and so, uh, so uh, Belvoir, it's just like, they guard the door for 10 minutes. The Sergeant Major Army gets to, to get some meditation and uh, goes in uh, to the massage chair and those sore muscles and a little bit of meditation. But those, that's what I'm talking about. What I was talking about earlier is that we, sometimes we're not using all the resources that we have. We have Army Wellness Center and they have stress management. Um, you know, I was trying to get one like, now we have a, a watered down or a less or a different version of that in the Pentagon, but uh, I said, no, no, we really need this in the Pentagon. Um, but there is at Belvoir, we have them all, all across the nation, I, actually across the globe. We have these wellness centers and sometimes uh, they're not utilized to the fullest extent. We have it, but you have to use it. Okay. All right. Uh, the next question. Could you talk about how the Army's new recognition of spiritual readiness supports holistic health and overall readiness? Well, I think that goes a little bit to the, the sort of broader topic we were just talking about is that, you know, I think there is a sort of a mind, body, spiritual connection. And, uh, you know, I know that Chaplain Soldrum has uh, spent a lot of time on this with our Chaplain Corps. 
you know, spirituality for, um, can be different for different people, obviously, but there's a lot of research that shows that um, having sort of, you know, a, a spiritual um, focus can be very beneficial for your mental and physical health. And so I think that's something, that's a dimension that we're trying to draw out. Uh, and I don't know, Chapton Soljum, if you maybe want to say a few words, because again, I know this is something you're really passionate about. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. So the, we just, I've been sitting here listening, I'm observing, we, we talk, and we talked about this this morning. Mm -hmm. I see the smile, SMA, you know where I'm going to go with this, right? So we're very comfortable talking physical. We're very comfortable talking mental. We get a little squishy when it comes to things spiritual. So just let me give context, right? Everyone, every person in this room is spiritual. Science, evidence-based science says all people are born spiritual. 30% innate, 70% the environment. So if you think about the, our army and its people and what they bring, spiritually prepared and ready or not, and then what we have as a responsibility as an organization, the opportunity to develop the other 70%. The Army is leading the nation in this area. So I'm very proud of our Army. I couldn't be more proud that the Army has taken this on, holistic health and fitness, and actually integrated and given us two things, a common understanding or operating picture of what spiritual is, and then a language to be able to communicate it to our soldiers and families. So I thank you for your leadership and for this endeavor, and the nation is really looking uh, to the Army in this area. Thank you. Hey, Chaplain, uh, I, I do want to say a thing, and I've heard this several times from all the soldiers sometimes. Uh, when you hear spiritual, sometimes your brain thinks religion. Um, we're actually talking about two different things. Spiritual, do you believe in something bigger than yourself? Um, and then when we find people that actually have those connections that believe in something bigger than themselves, um, I, th I think the statistic, what was it, Chaplain, 90% less likely to commit suicide? I mean, this is a, a statistical fact. What was it? Yeah, so the statistical fact Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. The statistical facts are that when it comes to, I'll start with suicide, um, you're 80% more protected from suicide um, when you have a strong spiritual core. When you couple that, you know, give me some of that 80%, I'll take it. And then when you couple that with a personal faith and belief of something outside of yourself, right, and then you share it in community with others, it's, it's almost off the charts. You're the most protected. So if you think of our soldiers, you think of the harmful behaviors, the other areas, whether it's depression um, or risk-taking behaviors or substance abuse, the, the numbers are the same there. So the science really shows that spiritual life, spiritual wellness and wholeness and, and well-being are absolutely critical to the outcomes that we're striving as an Army to get after. Yeah, and if you haven't sat through uh, one of the, the initiatives from the chaplain on this, uh, he's gone to camp posts and stations. Um, it's impactful. Uh, and I think it's Dr. Lisa Miller usually does that presentation. And uh, if you haven't, uh, you could probably probably YouTube some of that, and I encourage you all to look at that, uh, and it's different, and some soldiers go, it's all, oh, it's religion, it's, it's a little different, and I'd ask you to look into that, it's, it's really well done. Okay, all right, thank you. Next question, what can soldiers for life, our retirees, our veterans, do directly in helping the Army attract young talent into the Army? Start with that. Yeah, if you know, if you ever heard me talk on that one, is you know, we're we're asking our. In fact, we've gone out to them hard. You know, soldiers for life. We want you to inspire other young men and women to serve, and and this is really important because our soldiers for life are running around communities, the retirees, of veterans, and you know what we find is 83 percent of the soldiers that come in the army come from a military family, and so we have to do all we can to expose our army uh, to the American public. 44% come from JROTC high schools. And so, you know, at least we're going out and asking our soldiers for life, help us expose the army to young men and women uh, in your community and, 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 and encourage them to serve because there's really no better place that you can be all you can be. Thank you. All right. 
Okay, next question. This one is this one's pretty interesting here. All right, <laughs> seriously. Okay, uh, JBLM has a housing crisis. Families are struggling. Most housing lists have a six to 12 month wait list. Off post, many landlords are taking advantage of local BAH rates and overcharging for rent. On top of this, finance has been taking six plus weeks to adjust BAH rates after a PCS. There are even volunteer ran food pantries popping up on posts to ensure our families can eat. What can be done for incoming families? Why don't I uh, talk about this sort of at the strategic level and uh, particularly I know since SMA has spent time at JBLM, you know, you may want to say some things that are more tailored. You know, first of all, I would start with, you know, we know we have some housing challenges and we are really trying to work on them. Uh, we are really trying to work closely with the privatized companies who are doing housing uh, at places like JBLM and elsewhere. I saw it. we've got General Omar Jones here, our installation command CG. Uh, he meets, I think, every single week with the CEOs to go sort of family by family, who is out of houses, who is getting into houses. Um, we, I met personally with the CEOs myself about a month or two ago, and one of the things I really tried to emphasize with, to them is making sure that they have quality maintenance staff who are coming in and handling the work orders in a timely way with a customer service attitude. Uh, that's really, really important, I think, in terms of tenant satisfaction. Um, you know, we, we passed the tenant, tenant bill of rights at, uh, with the 18 tenants at all, of the, at all of our installations where we have privatized housing. One of the challenges we have, though, is, um, you know, how to, how, we've got to find some creative ways to work with those companies to be able to see them invest more in the housing. Uh, so we are working hard on that with IMCOM, with IE&E. Uh, we are very aware of the situ situation at JBLM, and I know we've got issues at Fort Leonard Wood, at Fort Gordon, uh, and those and, and and Fort Carson. And so we are actively, really trying to get um, to get after that set of issues. I don't know, as a mayor chief, if you want to elaborate. I'll just just add one thing, and you know, as a secretary, you know, about 35 percent of our families live on posts, so. Even if we get the whole post right, which we're, we're trying to do, is we still have about 65% of our troops living off post. And you know what's really been tough, and especially places you know, we we have a son at JBLM, so we're we're, we're aware of living who lives off post and, and going through those processes. Um, but you know, the, you know, especially with the increases in pricing that that's happened right now, it, it is a big deal. And uh, you know, we could talk about there are there are some. Um, some authorizations are in place to help folks as far as on temporary living allowances to try to get those things. But again, we have not solved that problem. We are raising uh, BHA at some of these places, but still has, but it takes time and it takes effort. And uh, we, are, we are trying to get after that. But so I mean, you got, you know, I don't know if you're going to talk about, you know, the authorizations that are different or, or what we can do. SMA, not, before we can you start, that, can so. I just uh, add something back in? Uh, because I realized BAH is, was part of the question, and I see we've got Undersecretary for Personnel and Readiness from OSD, uh, Mr. Gil Cisneros, and thank you so much for coming, Secretary Cisneros, and being part of this conversation. One of the things that we're doing is working with OSD to really look at how BAH is calculated and sort of what are the anchor points that go into that and what are the assumptions that go into utility rates, for example, because I think part of what we've got to look at is does the way we calculate BAH, you know, really um, incorporate some of the inflation costs that we've seen in the last couple of years? So that's something that we're really working on with OSD to try to get after this issue as well. Um, Madam Secretary, thanks. Uh, I've got a whole list, to, um, but I'll just caveat a couple of things. First of all, please, please read what the Secretary of Defense just put out on taking care of our people. Um, some of that was addressed, and we, we just have to know. You don't have to wait. So, um, you know, you, but some of this you have to apply for. Like, uh, if, you know, 1 January, the basic needs allowance, you're going to have to apply for that. Um, that's number one. That's, that's already there. It's already approved. It's coming. 
But if you don't know and you don't apply, yeah. your soldiers are frustrated. So please um, read through that one more time because some of that is being handled. Extended temporary lodging allowance. It can go longer so you can stay in a hotel. And nobody likes to stay in a hotel. I understand that. Um, but you have to know what entitlements are so that we some of this was addressed. And then lastly, it's what Madam Secretary said is how we calculate it, but also when we calculate BAH. Um, and I've said this a couple of times. It's, it, it, it cannot only be once a year. It needs to be a little bit more reactive. But what is that? And as we get to a digital age, how can we calculate BAH maybe twice a year? right before the PCS season. So when you are in that pinch, you can get a place to live based off the basic housing allowance. And the Secretary of Defense has um, addressed some of those issues, um, but it's still a struggle. And again, I, we often don't talk about this, but I, I just need to make sure as we receive people on our installations, we have to sponsor them well. We have, we have the resources in ACS that will help you find affordable living in an area, but if you don't go there, you don't know about it. And I know another former um, JBLM was the first Corps commander, which was the vice, and he set up a special office to help folks as they transition because of all the resources that we have. So please, in this case, if you're struggling, go to ACS. There are some resources on, especially JBLM and all your installations, and it's that can help you in that transition, but we will need some help. And I'm really glad that uh, Patty Barron is also here too, because she's a big champion. Um, but this is a complete department issue and we need to address it. Okay. All right, uh, next question. So we encourage suicide prevention for our soldiers. However, it's the family who sees the first sign. How can we better educate families on suicide prevention? Can we include child suicide prevention? The numbers of child suicides are staggering. That's a great question, um, you know, because obviously all of those kinds of things, it becomes a, a family dynamic. And often a family member will see a sign potentially sooner perhaps than squad mates might uh, at work. So I, I think, you know, we absolutely need to look in, you know, make sure that the programs we have um, focused on suicide prevention can include family members so that we can uh, talk to family members about the spirituality issues that the chaplain was talking about, uh, that we can help people see what the indicators might be that there's a problem. A lot of times uh, when we look at instances of suicide in our army, we see that it's connected to either um, financial challenges, substance abuse, uh, marital issues often. And so I think what we need to do also is really make sure that our families know that we have resources. If you're having some of those issues in your family, if you're struggling with financial management, you know, we have resources that can help you both with, with immediate issues um, like our emergency relief programs, which can help with loans and grants, but also longer term uh, financial planning. So we just need to make sure that we're informing families about the resources we have that can help with some of those underlying stressors. Yeah, the one thing, you know, the Sergeant Major and I talk a lot about, you know, the squad and the golden triangle. And, you know, I, I think we as leaders at every level have an obligation to build connections between our soldiers and our leaders making sure that every soldier has a buddy that cares about them. Every soldier's family knows who um, they can call when there's a problem. And you know, with a lot of uh, suicide situations, the family knows. Someone's not sleeping well, things aren't going well at home, but they, they really don't know who to call. There's not a connection there. And again, if, if we can identify these, these challenges early on, then we can get the appropriate help and get after that. So, uh, just a few points here, and I'm really glad you talked about my squad and knowing your squad mates. Um, I would I would even take it one step for, uh, further. Is as you receive people into your organization, step one is know their family, and they need to know who to call. And uh, we've got a lot of initiatives all the way from basic training in AIT, and how do we inform families on who to call? And sometimes, 
it's like uh, when a soldier goes to basic training, it's like the family is like, oh, I don't know, the Army. Okay, so we're looking at ways that we can post information on social media, and it may not just be related to suicide, just who to call. So as we get better at reception and integration into our units, that's the key. And you, we receive not just the soldier, but the family and the extended family, and we need to know who those are. And that's the Chief's talking about, Golden Triangle. The second part of that question was about child suicide. And I'll ask the G9 is, I, I know we do have family uh, life counselors in schools. Uh, I know we had one in Mann Middle School up in JBLM. And I know we had one, I think, Washington Liberty. Um, but I don't know uh, is that in every school, um, you know, where a post is. But I know they have some. I just don't know where um, they're at. And those are just for our children to have somebody to talk to at school so you could see a counselor that deals with military uh, children issues. That's not the end all do all, but that is a resource that uh, – may not be well known, and I don't know if you got more on that. We, we, we do. Uh, D, uh, can you answer that? I think we do. Uh, we, SMA, we can get you by location where we have our embedded mil military family life consultants, and they are in our school, they work in our CDCs, they work in our communities um, to make those connections. We can get you more details on there. Okay. All right. Uh, this is the next question. Uh, the notoriously slow and burdensome federal hiring process for civilians presents a tremendous barrier to military spouses seeking employment. What steps is the Army taking to make sure uh, it be can become faster for military spouses seeking employment as Army civilians? Yeah, G1. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Um, you know, I think I will um, give it to the G1 to, to get specifically into how we can do better. I mean, in some cases, we are seeking direct hiring authorities. Uh, so, for example, you know, the, the prevention specialists that we're trying to hire in fairly large numbers across a lot of our installations, all three compos, I think we're seeking direct hiring authorities. Uh, we are, um, I, I would say more broadly, before turning it to the G1, on the issue of spouse employment more broadly, we really are trying to do everything we possibly can here. You know, we are uh, trying to get the word out about the fact that we will reimburse folks up to $1,000 for professional licensing. Uh, and a good number of states now around the country have, have laws on the books to make licensing portable from state to state. Um, we are investing in a number of different sort of fellowship programs to try to match spouses who want employment with available opportunities in the private sector. Um, so there, you know, we are we are certainly trying to work on those issues, but but it is absolutely true that um, hiring as civilians takes longer than we would like it to. Some of that is about the security clearance process, and some of it is other things. So. Um, can I turn it to the G1 to give some specifics? Yes, ma'am, you can. Uh, you don't need a lot of help, though. You've hit a lot of the things that we've got going on. One of the things that we have, holding up right here, there's one across the room there, it's called Navigating Civilian Employment. It's kind of the way that you get through the system, because it is a system. A Title V U.S. Code tells us how we hire. We are getting direct hire authority. We are pushing remote work for some of our spouses because there's a lot of things that we do that can be done and travel with the spouse as they move. I know that we've got some lawyers that work to help with the G1 and their spouses, and they are not here in Washington, D.C. So that's another way that we're looking at to do that. Um, we do have a lot of fellowships that we're offering. Glad we gave one away today. Uh, to a very deserving family. Uh, we're also uh, putting up things on, on, our, on all of our websites to, to do that. The real piece that's hard about this is how do we teach our managers how to hire? It is a very complicated process, and there's those that do it well and those that don't. For, for, to cut it down, what you have to do is you have to prepare for your hiring. 
You have to put it out there. You have to get your panels, if you're going to use one of those, ready to go so that you don't waste a lot of time. Because if you look, we have what we call the pinks and blues, which is the way we re look at our time to hire. Blue uh, is the time for the Civilian Human Resources Agency, and pink is for management. Guess which block is bigger? So we have some work to do across all of our management people, the people that are doing the hiring to help with those folks that, that need those jobs and they need them now out there. Uh, we also have spouse preferences uh, that are portable. Uh, we just recently got a stat statutory change uh, that we got help from OSD, th thank you, uh, Honorable Cisneros, where we allowed our civilian uh, spouses to get out of PPP. For those of you who don't know what the priority placement program is, if you get offered a job, you have to take that job or you go to the back of the line. We've allowed spouses to take a look at all the jobs that they qualify for on the installation and then apply their preference, which makes a big difference in job satisfaction. And those are just a few of the things that we're working on, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Wallace, uh, I do want to uh, say that, um, you know, General Taylor, I am listening. Um, number one was we have to do better with USA jobs. Okay, I, I got the, I still have the task. I'm not letting it go. It's, it's, we can talk about all this, but if I have to have a PhD to get hired in a job, I'm gonna go somewhere else. And that's what our spouses, we are losing talent because the system is so hard to navigate. He held up a pamphlet. You know, I, I'm just assuming that, you know, on LinkedIn or and I'm not advertising for any, we'll say some system, anything you go into, <laughs> It's not that hard. You go, hey, I'd like to go for that job. That's great, good, let's hire you. I literally have to have a PhD uh, to get in USA job. So I, I, I appreciate all that, but I don't want you to walk away and think that I've let go of that topic. I am not letting go um, because we lose talent all the time, all the time. And, and I know this personally, you know, my spouse, or I was on uh, Fort Bragg. And on Fort Bragg, they're like, oh, we can open up all the pools. We just need lifeguards. So my daughter, get over there. Go to lifeguard school. She goes to lifeguard school, and she didn't get off her job. You know, and, and you, don't, you don't want to say anything because, you know, you're forced to come. And I'm like, oh, don't say anything. You know, it's okay, okay, I'm not saying anything. And then, then somebody goes, the MWR goes, hey, you know, we really need lifeguards. I'm like, okay, well, you didn't offer a job. You after half the class a job. I don't know. Oh, there's something wrong with the system. Um, so I've, I've watched this over and over, and I know there's spouses that are out there that are saying, please help us out with USA Jobs. I know that is not an Army system. I know it's a, all a government, but we, ha we can do better, and that's what we need, an easy system that can navigate the program so we don't lose talent when you move from low post to post. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to read. I was the G1, rec recovering G1, and I was in charge, as, as, as Roy <laughs> said this. And I, I could never figure it out, and uh, I've had too many people come to me, and U.S. jobs, you know, if we were in the business of trying to, you know, match people or do talent management, it doesn't work. And I don't know what to say. I don't know how to fix it. I wish I could. You know, I've, I've put out, you know, been through the whole process. But, you know, if anyone's out there that knows how to help fix that for certainly our spouses, I've seen so many qualified, you know, family members that, are absolutely the right, you know, person to take the job, and we're not trying to use influence or anything. And then, as Sergeant Major says, the job goes unfilled, and people come back, and you're in the command, you're going, we don't, we can't get enough of these type people. And you're going, well, these people over here want to do it. You want to hire them, but they don't come out. You know, they apply in USA. They they go into some machine somewhere, and 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 they don't come out the other end. And if they don't go in the machine, even though you want to hire them, and they want to be hired. It doesn't work. So, if anyone out there can help me and, and you know f try to figure out how that machine works, I don't know what goes on in that machine. But what I do know, and I'm an outcome-based person, is we're not able to take the talent we have and match it with the people that want to hire. Okay, that's where I'm at. So, I think Miss uh, the MNRA. Uh, so I I'm working on it. <laughs> um, I think everybody agrees that it is.
a challenge. I am also a victim of USA Jobs. I put in an application for something I was eminently qualified for. Six months later, I got a thank you for your interest in national security. I'm a disabled veteran, so I was very confused by all of this. Um, but that was an experience from about 10 years ago. I met with OPM. I'm um, Dr. For our DASA for our civilian personnel is working very, very closely on all of these problems. So there, it's not we're all wringing our hands and saying this is a terrible system. We're you know we're subject to what the OPM system is. We're actively working and aggressively working towards making it better. So we're working on it. <laughs> Okay, I think we got time for maybe two questions. Um, let me see if I can. Okay, all right. Uh, so this is um, okay. This next question: Would would you consider reviewing the current policy that prohibits single parents from joining the army? In today's society and recruiting efforts, we lose a lot of candidates because we require them to forfeit custody until they arrive to their first duty station. Obviously, you know, we are in a point right now with the Army and our recruiting landscape. I think we want to, you know, we are revisiting a lot of things, frankly, in terms of the way we've always done things. Uh, and we can certainly look at this. You know, I, I do think at the same time, you know, obviously um, serving in the Army is challenging. You know, we ask all of our Army folks and families to do hard things. And, you know, we, we require everyone to have a family plan. And I think for single parents, you know, that is something we want to make sure um, that anyone who's a single parent is going to be able to deploy, going to be able to go out on training, and uh, obviously have assurance that their dependents are taken care of. So there are some challenges with that that I think, you know, those are the kinds of issues why we've had the policy we've had. We can look at that, uh, and I think we're looking at a lot of things with fresh eyes, but I wouldn't want to make guarantees at this point. Yeah, Madam Secretary, I'm pretty sure the G1 already has uh, this question for action. Um, it came and the up, MNRA too. Yeah, and uh, the MNRA, they, we, it came up, I, I can't remember uh, whether it was in the uh, Army um, Recruiting and Ten uh, Retention Task Force uh, that was addressed and said, hey, what about this? A lot of single parents don't want to give up custody of their kids to go. But uh, I think it's already in action in the headquarters that we're looking at. Obviously, we don't have the answer yet. And clearly, we've I not brought that to the Secretary of the Army. Yeah, I see nodding heads. Yes, ma'am, it is. It's part of the RTF work that we're doing right now. Okay. All right. This is the last question, so we're almost out of time. Uh, all right. Um, can we make it mandatory that all soldiers, active, guard, reserve, see a mental health provider annually? You know, I think um, we've had, you know, we've talked a little bit in this forum already about mental health issues. and. At the SMA made some good points about, you know, be, be, access to behavioral health resource is not the answer to everything. You know, it is not a silver bullet. It's an important uh, resource that's out there, but it's not the only one that's out there. And so to scale up, you know, and have the entire about a million person or even the, you know, the active army 465,000 people strong to do 100% uh, wellness checks would be very, very resource intensive. And I think we have to look very carefully at what, um, you know, what result we're going to get for that investment. I think it's, you know, we're probably better off looking at the totality of resources that we have available to make sure that our soldiers and families are supported and healthy physically and mentally. And again, that is that is about the golden triangle. That's about taking care of your squad. It's also, a, it's about, you know, health and holistic fitness, and it's, a, it's about behavioral health. Um, yes, I guess I, I think um, the question was behavioral health. And because um, I have asked and and I did that already at the AFAB with the Office of the Surgeon General to look at how do you can how can you do a wellness check not 
necessarily everybody sees a behavioral health provider, but how can you see do a wellness check and that could that be part of your your annual checkup? Uh, and I'm very deliberate with the wellness check versus behavioral health. Um, if you need to seek behavioral help, um, that's the dilemma. We don't have enough. We've already acknowledged that. Um, and then maybe I don't need to see behavioral health. Um, do we want to give that time slot for somebody that actually really needs, I need this appointment right now. Uh, and that's the dilemma, but there are other ways and we've seen success by um, uh, the big red one and we've seen by the Mission 100 in Alaska, but those wellness checks are not always done by the behavioral health specialists. It could be uh, the military family life counselor. Uh, it could be uh, your chaplain. Um, so what, what does that look like? And I think we're still working through that, Madam Secretary, um, but not just everybody sees behavioral health because if you don't need it, then you're going to take a time slot for somebody that really, really needs to see behavioral health. Yeah, I think just, you know, having someone that works in that business in the Army and what, what they will tell, you, tell us is behavioral health officers right now have very full schedules. I mean, they're, they're, they are, you know, and what we want to do is make sure that those who really need it can get it soon enough. And one of the biggest complaints that we get is from behavioral health is you can't get to see a, uh, a provider. And if we were to put more in it, but, but you know, what we're seeing is the big red one had everyone go see a military uh, family life uh, counselor or, or you know, some type of counselor, almost if you look at it as a triage type thing. So the idea for a lot of people don't, don't know the difference, would be like, you know, going to see a medic, just, you know, you know, doing the initial checkout. And then if someone has a problem, they're going to go see a specialist and the specialist work your way through it. So I think there's value in doing that. You know, the, the idea that, you, you know, you, you get some type of check and it could be with it could be with the chaplains and we got great chaplains and we have great uh, military family life counselors, but you know the specialists. We, we want to get the people that really have behavior health needs to the people that do that stuff for a living. And again, there's only so many of them, and they only have so much time. Okay. All right. Uh, so that ends our questions. Uh, I would also tell you that we do have a lot of folks who probably had some unanswered questions. So uh, I would also offer the opportunity uh, for you to engage our Army staff. We have. Uh, folks from the G1, the G4, our chaplain's office, our Surgeon General, uh, G9, uh, MNRA. We have all of our major staff elements here, so we will we will take your questions uh, after it's all over with, and we want to make sure that you walk out feeling that uh, your your questions were were answered, or at least uh, we're going to come back to you and try to resolve some of this. So, uh, I'd also I'm going to take the opportunity now to provide our Army senior leaders an opportunity. Uh, to make some closing comments. So we're going to start with, uh, with the Star Major of the Army. I just want to say thank you to all the families. Um, you know, I've been around the world for 35 years, drug my family all over the place, and um, I would not be sitting here if it wasn't for uh, my wife and my kids, uh, without, a, uh, without a doubt. And the reason he introduced me is Alexander's husband is a lot of people say, well, how do we address you? And I said, well, I really don't care. <laughs> Just don't screw up this Alexander's <laughs> husband or Sophia and Isabella's dad, because those are my favorite two titles. After that, I'll answer to pretty much any old thing. So um, I couldn't uh, be more proud of what you all have done uh, in the last three or four years to support your soldiers. And I couldn't be more proud to be your Sergeant Major of the Army. Well, well thanks, Sergeant Major. And uh, we are. You know, and, and again, I've been along, around a lot of sergeant majors, and, and, and there's no one that cares more about our soldiers and families and, and than, our, than our sergeant major, and I really, truly appreciate that. And the one thing I would add is for, for the families is, you know, we are committed to giving our families and soldiers the quality of life that they've, they've earned, and we don't always get it right. And so, you know, hold us accountable on post. We've got a lot of leaders here. Make sure that that's happening. Um, you know, when I look at privatized housing, you know, and they're not delivering what they need to deliver. Last time I checked, we're still paying them the money they're supposed to get for that, so they should deliver. When I look at moves going bad, I go, did I miss something, or were you not paid for that move we're about to be able to do? And all these other type things that are going on, we're paying people for uh, health care out in the market, you know. So if they're not doing these type things, you know, we need to hold them accountable. 
and you know because we are we are actually purchasing all these these services and we have leaders here and i would just you know ask that you you know if something's going wrong bring it up give the chain of command a chance to solve it and if they can't solve it come to us because everyone else does okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think I could say, um, say it better than both the SMA and the chief, but I would like to thank you all. You know, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for being a part of the Army. Thank you for supporting your soldiers. Um, it's, it's just really something special to see. I also uh, would be remiss, um, first for SMA, I'm, I'm still in denial that eventually this particular SMA is going to move on, uh, but, but it occurs to me all of a sudden that while I'm sure this is not the last um, general family forum for the SMA or for General McConville, this is the last family forum for uh, here at AUSA for Sergeant Major of the Army Grinston and for our great chief. Uh, they are both, you know, two tremendous Army leaders, uh, and this will